they live this principle that failure is not an option. And not because they can't fail, it's because they can't not fail because they risk so much. And so they don't, failure literally is not in their language bank. It's like we just try things until we figure it out. Whereas other people say, I tried that and I failed, I tried that and failed, three strikes, you're out, whatever. Forget it. Seals just keep going until they figure something out. And that's the attitude that you have with growth. If you apply that to your growth in life, that there is no such thing as failure. Mark and I have talked a lot about both on camera, off camera, about the importance of therapy. Mark's wife is a therapist. I recommend therapy, which is why I've partnered with BetterHelp. That's better, H-E-L-P dot com slash Dr. Lion. We do live in a new environment right now, and sometimes people are a bit more restricted in their ability to travel. This is online therapy. It's really keeping up with the times. You don't have to go into an office. You can get online therapy uh, that offers video, phone, live chats. You don't have to see anyone if you don't want to. This is a much more affordable way to get therapy than in person. If finances are a challenge, you'll be matched within a therapist, with a therapist in under 48 hours. My listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash Dr. Lyon. I think that this is a great service. Strongly suggest that you check it out. And if you are having a hard day, don't wait. If you're not having a hard day, plan for when those days are going to happen and prepare yourself. So check out BetterHelp Online Therapy. Welcome to the Dr. Gabrielle Lyon Show, although... Actually, uh, Mark, we're sitting here in your office. <laughs> um, former commander, Mark Devine. But that's not actually why I wanted to talk to you today. Um, I have known you for since before 2014. Amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. And um, you've accomplished quite a bit in your life. Zen master, black belt. Lots of smoking holes in the ground, too. Yep. The way. <laughs> Lots of, of time in the <laughs> SEAL teams. Oh, I like that. I like that interpretation. I was thinking more like failures. No, no, uh, no, no. I mean. Those are some of my biggest accomplishments. Th actually, there, yeah. There's that. But why I'm so excited to be able to sit down with you today is because I feel quite fortunate to have interfaced and know a lot of people that move the needle for the world and you are one of a kind Aww. and Shucks. when you come into the room and you don't get credit for this by the way no I didn't even know this until when this is right and when you come into the room the whole room shifts and that's not what I believe because of any conscious effort this is cultivated over years and is part of who you are, which is so unique. And, and I hope that at some point, every one of my listeners will get to experience you in person because there is something profound. It's almost as if transmission happens. Mm -hmm. Chuck Teapot. I, I don't know what it is. Yeah. And um, there's a lot that I, I really want to cover. You're an expert in leadership. You are an expert in not just leadership from the esoteric perspective, but you certainly lead yourself in multiple domains. And I'm curious as to your greatest strength. Mm -hmm. I was, that's a great question. Um, of course, I have to lead with, with great humility. I would say my greatest strength is humility. <laughs> <laughs> and uh and also you know my understanding of what that is because i it, i probably could have told you 20 years ago that i had humility and i would have been incorrect mm -hmm. um and so another term would be authenticity right y you can even bring Brene brown's term vulnerability into this but as a navy seal 
I don't really like <laughs> the idea of being vulnerable, right? right? right. So I can call, I'll call it authenticity. And I've uh, worked really hard in my life to develop that authenticity, to take off the mask and to just live the, the, the utter truth of the moment. And in the moment, things are. They just are. They are the way they are because of an infinite number of reasons. And so to have, for me, that is just one of the most incredibly humbling things is that, okay, yeah, here we are, you and I, mm. or here we are, me and whatever, in front of yeah. a thousand people. This is a very humbling moment because it could have been any other infinite number of possibilities. And so in that, we have magic that can happen because in that moment, I don't have to be projecting some false sense of self. I can just allow the awesomeness of whatever is supposed to happen happen. I don't have to fear that I'm not enough because what is happening is happening. And so obviously I am enough mm. or else it wouldn't be happening. And I don't have to pretend that I'm something I'm not. The mask can come off. So I, I think humility is a, a, it's a skill, but it's not something that you can learn in a classroom. You know, it's not something you can even read about and suddenly get it. How did you develop that? I think just, uh, you know, there's a few ways you can develop it. One is just by getting yourself kicked in the cojones <laughs> enough yeah. and recognizing that that's okay. That's just life. And then to learn to look forward to that because that's where the rich lessons are. The most powerful growth comes from the biggest challenges and so to seek out those challenges and so I've, I've done that and I think anyone listening who's really put themselves out there in a big way understands that like you go after the challenge and if you don't then life will throw some challenges at you that may be less savory and is that you know? the idea of dharma I mean dharma is kind of doing what it's you're meant sort of to related do. it's sort of related but let me talk talk you uh, briefly about the second way to develop humility, and that's through daily practice of, um, I call it integration, right? A daily practice of becoming whole. And the more whole you become, the more humble you become. Because wholeness also is another word of saying um, um, united or complete. And there's no complete, so that's not the right word. There's no there there in this process. But when you integrate, and we use the term in Unbeatable, the five mountains, which you've heard, when you integrate yourself physically, mentally, emotionally, intuitionally, and spiritually, and then those become one thing, you begin to live from the inside out, right? That journey of integration is from the outside in, but then once you integrate, you live from the inside out. And from the inside out, there's no separation. There's no separation with other humans, no separation with Mother Earth. You recognize the sameness while applauding and enjoying and playing with the differences, right? And so that right there is humility, right? Now, you brought up the concept of dharma, which means calling, right? That would probably be an appropriate interpretation of the word. Like, let me, let me stop you. Let me yeah, ask you this. So if you are humble and you're living in this place of it's almost like peace, it sounds like you're not getting too attached to the yeah. ebbs and flows. You could say that. You could say that peace would lead to humility. These are all like, this is how words limit us, right? They contract us or constrain our understanding. So it's the experience we're looking for. An experience beyond words is the experience of humility. Now, we can try to capture the essence of that with the word humility, but it's not enough. So if you, if you were to combine the notions of humility with peace and peacefulness and contentment, and equanimity or balance, right? And there's probably a few others. And recognize that as also the center of your very being that is your birthright that everybody has. That once you find that and can live from that, then all these other differences and things that we think we are begin to go away. It's not that, for instance, Mark Devine isn't also a former retired Navy SEAL and also an entrepreneur and also a podcaster and also an author and whatnot, whatever identities or labels you want to place on me, but I don't live from those labels. How? I that, live from that center. Yeah, that's... And that comes from practice, but it also can come from 
overcoming life's challenges with a smile and that's resilience right you're getting kicked and waking up you know getting up and saying wow that was a good one <laughs> what did i learn from <laughs> that oh, and then you you laugh at it you learn to laugh at yourself i read a great quote the other day like a, a human being wakes up when they can first laugh at themselves and so you laugh at yourself and say wow that was awesome now bring it on try that one again mm-hmm. but i'm going to do it differently this time because i've learned something and like I said earlier, you learn to embrace the suck of the challenge and you bring the challenge to yourself. You don't wait for it to come. And so you combine, in, in my world, I combine this idea of like going after the challenge and learning and growing. Which is intense. And, which is intense. And there's a lot of what most people, the common individual would call failure in there, but I don't look at it as failure. You know, one of the things I did learn from the SEALs, that the SEALs are remarkable at this, is that they live this principle that failure is not an option. And not because they can't fail, it's because they can't not fail because they risk so much. Mm-hmm. And so they don't, failure literally is not in their language bank. It's right. like we just try things until we figure it out. Whereas other people say, I tried that and I failed, I tried that and failed, three strikes you're out, whatever. Forget it, seals just keep going until they figure something out. And that's the attitude that you have with growth. If you apply that to your growth in life, that there is no such thing as failure. Just keep trying until you learn the lessons and then move on to the next lesson. Combine that with a daily practice of integration, and we can talk more about what that could look like. And you have this one-two punch that could become mutually supportive. In fact, the way I organized the training for you know, my company was mm-hmm. practice, 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 test yourself. What's the test? It's the crucible. The 50-hour Kokoro, you know, which means heart, mind, merged in action. 50-hour crucible modeled after the SEALs head, Hell Week. That's the test. There's no failing there. Even if you only make it six hours, 12 hours, there's no failing. You, it's learning. It's growing. It's understanding who you are and your capabilities and your limitations so you can then come back, and, you know, go practice and train, practice and train, then come back again and try it again. So the combination of daily training and practice with challenges And that failure is not an option mindset leads to great progress, accelerated progress. And are you... I think that's what's happening. Yeah. And are you aware when you're out of alignment, if you're you're training this every day conceptually, do you feel it? When you're early in the journey, it takes time and also feedback, Mm -hmm. right? So you get feedback mostly from those who are closest to you. (laughs) significant other or spouse so i was fortunate you know sandy to yeah. be married to a therapist so <laughs> i got some feedback pretty early on you know that i was like oh, i'm not sure i would have gotten that feedback you know mm-hmm. had i not been married to her or had i had someone who wasn't um, as astute at pointing stuff like that out or your kids or uh, you know your peers or a mentor or coach right because we're inside the bottle we can't read our own label Right. But the more you practice and you more your journey reaches that center, then it's imagine like your the pond is getting calmer and calmer. Like it starts out when you live an outward life, when everything is all out here, yeah. then it's like you're living in this Which choppy is sea. Like the or Western. You're at, it's the Western mindset, Western, Western, Western mindset. approach. We're yeah. trained that way. And so sometimes it's sunny and sometimes it's stormy and we think it's that we think that we're making all that happen. It's not really. I mean we are at a spiritual level. But we misidentify with what's happening outside us as being the main thing. So when it's stormy, our life sucks. When it's sunny, our life is great. And we think, oh, right? So I'm exhausting. making that happen. <laughs> That's so exhausting. It's exhausting <laughs> to go through all that. And every day you're getting triggered and, and, and you're living emerged with the drama outside of you. So you, you do the practice journey inward and the water gets calmer and calmer. This is the idea of still water runs deep. But maybe a better metaphor is you're, you're dipping below the surface. And then you go deeper and deeper until when you're work, living from that center, it's calm and still all the time. Is that how you feel? Yeah. And so then when you look upward or outward, you see stuff happening, you know, business transitions, people doing things, COVID happening, people dying. And it doesn't change that center because it's so deep and so calm. But you can see that, that there's a little chop going on the surface, but you don't identify with it. You don't get swept up in it. And then furthermore, imagine, you know, if there is a internal disruption in the sense of like suddenly you're off track with your dharma or your calling. And, yeah. And, and you're like, you feel that really quickly. You do. It's like dropping a pebble into the depth and, and it just ripples out and you feel it almost instantaneously. The more practice you get, the more real time it gets. Like it could be 
ultimately it's every day and then it literally is in the moment like you feel like something's off and you're like hmm because that depth is being disturbed really close to the source and when you say dharma for the way that i interpret dharma is this idea of doing what you're meant to do maybe that's not accurate yeah. but dharma ha- is a very complicated subject which I just uh, <laughs> oversimplified. No, you didn't, because there's a lot you could look at this truly metaphysically, or you can look at it from the law of cause and effect, which is, again, more of the Western scientific view that people under, would understand cause and effect. I do this, it led to that, and there's a consequence. And so that's karma. So karma and dharma work hand in hand, or hand in glove. Right? Because one could argue that we come into this life to have a major life lesson, right? And that's because we have karmic energy built up from past lifetimes that has to be resolved. And so this is the Eastern viewpoint is so we end up reincarnating or incarnating largely to resolve that karmic energy. But there's also some other quality to that, right? So there's a quality that led you to reincarnate, to, to overcome your karmic energy, but also to fulfill a dharmic kind of need or drive or interest that your spirit had, which would be, you know, to be a doctor and a, and a servant, right? To warriors, and, and so it's, un, it's unfolding because dharma does do that, right? I consider dharma to be an archetypal energy. Interesting. It's not a it's not a job, right? You can take if you're clear about your archetypal energy or and even where you are along that arc, then it it, it makes great sense to create a mission around that and then either to build a job or to align. What would be an example of that? Archetypal (coughs) energy. The warrior energy that I uncovered when I was meditating and becoming a CPA and a business, you know, a wealthy business professional. That was the idea, anyways back in the day (laughs) I'm still working on that and uh, before I joined the SEALs and I got into meditating every day through my martial art I tell that story in the way of the SEAL and unveil mind and and so it was incredible because sitting in that silence and and tapping into that still water that we talked about it took about a year or two then this the dharma was revealed to me the calling started to come to me in feelings and imagery and it was not to be a navy seal it was to be a warrior mm. it was meant to be a warrior oh interesting and the right? navy seal just then that was the, the navy vehicle. seal came mm. after i started to take it seriously and i started to ask questions about oh that's interesting could i do that how could i do that also so that had to be in that order first was could i do that and the answer was yes how could i do that could I be a warrior at Cooper's and Librand or back at Divine Brothers, you know, manufacturing company in upstate New York? No. Not for me. Could other people be warriors in those fields? Sure. Could I be a warrior as a fighter jockey? Because I thought maybe I, you know, that'd be kind of cool to fly jets. So I looked at flying jets for the Marine Corps, and that's, and I lived with that, and I visualized that, and I, you know, and I call it put, putting on the uniform, you know. And for me, it was no, no. Other people are phenomenal warriors for that, but it was not. That was not the energy that I was bringing or I could bring to the warrior archetype. And so while I was asking those questions, that's when I actually even learned of the SEALs. It was back in 1987, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of information about that. No, that was still... a secret organization with mm-hmm. about 800 people. And yeah. And I just walked by a recruiter's office one day and I was like, whoa, look at that. You know, there's this poster on the wall, Navy SEALs doing cool shit. And the title of the poster was Be Someone Special. It didn't say anything about the SEALs. Mm-hmm. But I was, I was transfixed. I said, that's it. That was an op- that's an example of synchronicity. Mm-hmm. When you get clear upon your calling, then, you know, just like you said earlier, something happens when I step in the room, then the uni- something happens in the universe because this alignment happens, right, in your mind, in your spirit. And in that alignment, other things start to be revealed to you. You see things that you couldn't see before or you're led to things that you weren't weren't accessible to you before or people come into your life that are aligned with that energy suddenly and we call that synchronicity. Mm-hmm. So that's an example of how the archetypal calling of being a warrior led to the profession 
of being a military special operator. And because I had the epigenetics and the genetics of being a hardcore, physically fit, endurance athlete, martial artist, triathlete. God, what an swimmer, underachiever. Right, Oof. underachiever there. And I had the intellect Brutal. to do it. Yeah. That fed into like, do I, am I a warrior as an elite special operator in the SEALs or something else? Because it made that possible. When I saw the SEALs, if I didn't have all that other stuff, but that's it, almost, it would have almost, been fantasy instead of, yeah. instead of like a strong possibility. It's almost as if you were destined to be that it's and possible. do that. Yeah, and I think that's another part is that destiny and, and dharma are really the same thing. And I could have chosen a different path and not have known, right? But I think later on in life, I would have had to reckon with that. And I think a lot of people are challenged. I feel incredibly fortunate to have uncovered that, that dharma, that calling when I was 23, mm-hmm. right? Instead of when I was 53. And this is what leads to the midlife crisis, mm-hmm. right? One of the things that Mark and I didn't talk about in this episode really is nutrition. Both Mark and I are very tight on our nutrition, oftentimes for us when we're traveling, and really for everybody, it's difficult to get in fruits and vegetables. They are incredibly important. You know, when I think about fruits and vegetables, I think about their bioactive compounds, meaning their color. These colors have components in them like polyphenols, carotenoids, things that are very protective. If you are feeling run down and you are not getting enough of your fruits and vegetables, I highly recommend First Form's Opti Reds 50. Stuff tastes amazing, tastes like berries. You can get it in a jug or you can get it in individual packages. Go to first form that's one s t p h o r m dot com slash dr lion for free u.s shipping also if you are in the military they ship nearly to any military address love this product it's also great for gut health it works as a prebiotic which feeds a good bacteria in your gut first form slash dr lion if you have any questions feel free to message me personally. I love this company and I love this product. Now, the other thing that's really cool about Dharma is it, it does evolve, right? And so for me in my 20s, the warrior, this is why I call it an archetype, which has an arc to it. It was the, the outward path of the warrior in my 20s was the warrior athlete, you know, the warrior of leader, course. right? Of course. And then in my... 30s, it started to become more like the warrior scholar and, you know, and um, strategist. Mm -hmm. And I got into teaching other warriors, warrior teacher. And um, and then so the outward journey of of your life kind of takes you through your about 40. And then you kind of there's this turnaround point where you start to go in the other direction. And the arc of your dharma starts to head in a different direction. It's much more inward more spiritual. And the warrior never went away, but now it's much more like the warrior monk or the warrior sage. And so you can see how that arc played out. You know, if I was still running around with the seal, you know, seals right now, right. I'd be burned out and I'd be like probably lost, even though there's part of me that just loved to go right. kick ass and take names. Yeah, names. of course. You know I mean? I yes. still train every day cause <laughs> yeah, in case yeah. I'm going to get the call. You know what I mean? Yeah, you'll be ready. It's a fun fantasy. Yes. Yeah, be ready if the balloon goes up. But um, I also recognize that that's, that's a different part of the archetypal journey that I've left behind. Do you think it's predictable? I don't think it's really predictable unless you have radical clarity from deep practice or you're born with that level of clarity. And I think that this is another part of the Eastern philosophy that I do agree with. We talked about this about with your son, Leo. Yeah. Is that if you buy into this idea of reincarnation, which I think is actually provable fact, then you also have to ask, well, how come some people are just like cavemen or cave women? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Maybe. Okay. (laughs) I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Right? And others are born, you know, with the wisdom of the Dalai Lama. Like, well, yeah. how do you account for that? And I think it's that, you know, 
when you think of reincarnation and overcoming karma and fulfilling dharma, you know, it's it's trial and error for the first 10,000 lifetimes. Right. You know right. what I mean? There's just a lot of, like, because you're so merged, you're not taught these things, you know, we don't have guides and teachers often. The yogis had an expression that it took a thousand years to find yoga. A thousand lifetimes, not a thousand years, a thousand lifetimes to find yoga. And so, if you come into this life ripe because you've had thousands of years and you found yoga, you know, 50 years ago or 50 we're, lifetimes we're, we're ago. We're going to start Leo early. Yeah, yeah. And so <laughs> you just, and then you could have great clarity as a, at a very young age. Like a Panchi Lama, right? You find that person and, he, and he's reincarnated because that's who he was supposed to be. Because he's ripe and he's ready for that role. And so that would be where how karma and dharma would play out, you know, in, in the life of someone who's already had extreme spiritual advancement. Mm-hmm. But, but his dharma or her dharma was to come back and perfect it even further in service to humanity, to teach or to be there like Jesus at a certain place at a certain time or the Buddha to, to, to literally create a transformative effect that would affect all of humanity for thousands or 2,000 years or tens of thousands of years. So people can get born for those dharmic purposes even though you would say, well, why would they even need to come back? It's because earth is calling them back or you know, they're kind of sent back in this, you know, for a very specific purpose. For most people, we're, we're really dealing with just awakening to this idea that you have a calling. That's a huge deal for people. I think most people, it's probably even more difficult now because we're, so, we're exponentially more distracted. At the same time, we have exponentially more teachers and more trainings around this, and it's much more accepted in our culture. I mean, look at the changes that have happened just in the past 10 years when we first met me. You know what I mean? Yeah. I was teaching this stuff to a bunch of people staring at me like, what the F are you talking about? You know, back in 2006, I had, in fact, <laughs> beautiful, in view of mine, when I, when I taught the SEALs yoga, I had to stop calling it yoga, right? Because they're like crossing their eyes and snickering. Right. And I'm like, this guy, yeah, all right, yeah. forget this. We're going to take all of the breathing and we're just going to call it box breathing. And this is going to be the hardest right? thing that you've ever and had to do. it's going to be a badass. Ever. It's going to make you a, you know, a badass <laughs> warrior if you just sit down and breathe. And they're like, okay, bring it on. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yep. Anyways, we're going all over the okay. place here. But um, so what happens if an individual doesn't necessarily follow their path? And I'm curious, is... Is that why you're so interested in leadership? Because there's self-leadership, mm-hmm. but it also seems as if you're interested, or maybe I should ask, leadership globally. Yeah, I think that it's related, right? Because the most important aspect of self-leadership is understanding why you're here and then creating a mission around that and then and then taking action to fulfill that mission and then figuring out how to attract, recruit, train, and organize a team to support you with humility right so that's leadership now you could look at every one of those it's like how do you lead a team well i could teach weeks courses on that right yeah and how do i but but ultimately at the very center is like why am i doing this why are you doing why this? am i doing this yeah right? why that's the why that's the yeah. don that's the calling right you but d- you personally are so driven you're humble and calm Mostly. No, just kidding. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. be, um, but you yourself are so deeply driven. I, you know, what drives that? That's Is, the calling. It's, it's, you know, sometimes I even want to walk away from it, but I can't. My ego, which is still working on refining, right? It's still there, right? You can't ever kill the ego because the human body would just fall over, you know, and be done. <laughs> We know what to do with You can itself. just yeah. turn more and more toward mm. that inner self, right? More and more toward the spirit and live from that. And doesn't mean your ego doesn't have all the subconscious programming and all the conditioning from childhood. And that's where the emotional work comes in. You right. just constantly work on that to clarify. And, and so my, and I call that when you're aligned with your, your inner self or your spirit or whatever you want to call that, again, words limit us, then you have an inner guidance system. Right? And the inner guidance system will tell you whether you're on track. 
in a, either on a day by day basis or in an arc with your career or your job or the business, you know, as it's going. And you often don't know except to say that this is what I'm supposed to be doing and that you'll know when you're supposed to make a change. Right. And this is where it gets a little tricky because you still have to take action. Right. And in, in, the, in the world, things get done through action. And so you have to build structures and build teams and everything like that. But the more clear you get, what you realize is that oftentimes those structures and we were talking about this earlier, those structures then become your limiting factor. Yeah. Seems that way. Right. And so you don't necessarily you want to work, influence, do your job, fulfill your calling with, with less and less structure. Because anytime you create something in the real world, mm. it's already in the past. And it creates a, somewhat of a hindrance. It can perhaps. create a hindrance. So unless you're wise enough as a leader to create a, a self-learning, self-organizing system that also has a why of its own. And so you, you basically inject your spirit into an organization, but then get away from it and let the organization then have its own autonomy and its own life. It's much easier to do from ground zero than it is to come back into an organization yeah. and to try to do that in retrospect. Yeah. So that's, a very, that's why most change efforts fail. It's very hard to change a culture once it's set in, in an In an organization. Yeah. You know, and I have lots of questions like what makes a good leader, but before I ask some of those obvious questions that you'll be like, oh, I've heard this a million times, you know, I'm curious as to, you know, you obviously are here working and then when you leave the office or whatever it is you're doing, there's always space in between. You know, I have space in between patients, space in between activities. What occupies your mind? What I decide to put in my mind occupies it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's, you know, I always wonder yeah. Be and the reason I ask that is because, you know, I will catch myself being unconscious or thinking about maybe even processing something. And uh, so let me let me talk about mental training for a second. So most people, the default mode, as you heard about it before, the default mode network is um, is how the human brain will operate without any training. And so without any deliberate training, I should say. Because if we're not deliberately training our mind, then it's being trained by culture, society, right. the people you hang around, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so that leads to this default mode, which is negative. You know, I've read somewhere maybe five times as negative as, you know, it could be, I guess. Or I don't know what that stat really means, five times versus what. It's just negative. And Probably uh, survival. there was actually an article, some researchers came up with, they actually identified the neurotransmitter and the actual molecules that it's like a consider a railroad track. So information comes into your amygdala, amygdala, right? And so then the, it triggers a certain neural pathway or trend and it's like a railroad track and it can, and there's a switch, you know, like just like a train switch. So one c molecule will send it to the left path, which is negative. Another molecule will send it to the right path, which is more positive and productive, right? So for a lot of people, that right path is just completely switched off because the, the difference is the left path is default. Like if you don't actively do anything mm. to turn, to switch it, yeah, then the left is always on. And then, and, and uh, even if you do say in a moment, I'm going to switch this to the right path, as soon as the train is on that track and, and through the switch, it switches back to the default. So the, the brain has this proclivity toward negativity and default mode of looking at everything as negative and everything is fearful. And we were designed like this. We weren't designed. We evolved like this. And it's actually gotten worse because of the fear mongering and the, you know, a, a, a culture that is promoting fear both through media and the government and consumerism, right? So fear of uh, you know not being perfect, fear of being overweight, fear of being too skinny, fear of, right? Fear of your table. <laughs> <laughs> Very exciting. Right? And yeah, so all yeah. that. So that's how we are trained naturally. And that is why people are all attached to these stories and dramas. And they haven't learned to separate from that and haven't learned how to train the positive to be on all the time instead of the negative. 
So it, this points to a certain amount of um, work that needs to be done mm -hmm. to train the brain, which then affects your mind, or to train the, the mind, brain. Okay. which will affect the brain. And they, it, it works both way, right? Yeah. It's, it's really hard to say which, you know, if the physiology is, is changing before the psychology or the psychology is changing before the physiology, or it's happening simultaneously. And I think there's a, a lot of times it's kind of, y there's physiological things you do, like right. movement patterns that'll change your brain. Yep. And then there's psychological things you do, which will change the underlying structure of the brain. But ultimately, the brain is an expression of the mind, and the healthier your mind is, the healthier your brain will be, and vice versa, right? So they co-arise, let's call it that. So this problem that we have with our brain being wired negatively and this misperception that we are our thoughts leads to great suffering, leads to great problems. Mm -hmm. And it points to this notion that, well, is there a way to change this, right? So we know from Gerald Dweck's work that, you know, 5% maybe will recognize this and, rec and start to take active control over their lives and change. We call that a growth mindset. And um, everyone listening here has a gross mindset, obviously. So welcome to the 5%. <laughs> We're trying to grow We're that. I was just thinking. We're trying to make this 10%. Least, right? Yeah, yeah. So when you begin to tr uh, recognize that you can and you should and you actually must take responsibility for training your mind, then the question is how? And so a lot of people will jump right to like a Headspace app or, you know, whatever, Insight Timer and they're like, or Muse. I'm going to uh, start meditating without really understanding like what needs to be done with my mind, mm -hmm. right? Where, where am I at, right? It's kind of like if someone walked into your gym and said they wanted to start doing snatches and you looked at them and they were overweight and they had a lot of dysfunctional movement patterns, you would be like, you know what? Maybe not now. Right. Let's start with just learning how to move the body functionally with, with you know, air squats and pull-ups and push-ups. And then we'll work with a PVC pipe to open up the joints to get the range of motion, strengthen the lumbar, and then we'll do snatches with a barbell right. or a, you know, a piece of wood and then a barbell and blah, mm. blah, blah, blah. It, there's a whole progression. Well, just like with the body, there's a progression for training the mind. And this is one of the, the great disservices that happened when meditation was you know, transported over here is that there was no progression. It, it was, came, came over here as a one-size-fits-all. And in the m most, probably the two forms that, that happened were uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction or mindfulness training and transcendental meditation. And I think both of those, again, I'm not putting down the, either the organizations or the method. It's just that no, no, of course. there's preparatory work that can be done, that needs to be done. It's like, think about, you know, the story, or even the modern Western story of um, the Karate Kid, right? So he goes and finds Miyagi. Miyagi right. didn't just immediately start teaching right. backflip spinning kicks, right? he had him literally do wax on, wax off on the fence. And that was to start to condition his mind through concentration training to be able to just slow down the quantity of his thinking. And not even talking about the quality of his thinking yet. So there is a very distinct process that the ancients used to teach that had gotten lost. Or if like, another example of this is if you went to a Tibetan monastery and said, hey, I, want to, I want to meditate and be one of your monks, they would have said, okay, let just go work in the kitchen, you know, and, and they'll, just, they'll just watch until they get a sense for where is this, what's this person's dharma, what's his character. His dharma might be like not to be there and they'll send him away, right? They'll get a sense for the, the whole makeup and then they'll be like the, 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 the masters would be like, okay, so this is what this individual needs. So we'll, we'll then prescribe him just like you would prescribe an individual diet to someone. They'll prescribe an individual diet of mental training that'll be unique to that individual. Now, this is very advanced. I don't know of anyone in America who could do this. I can do it mostly, right? I'm still learning. So it's that individual prescription. Now, now you can back off from that and say, okay, that sounds great, Mark, but like if nobody can do it, then why is this relevant to me? Well, just like an ideal situation with an individual coming to a, your, you for fitness and nutrition would be ideal not everyone can afford that. Not everyone has the skills. So there are some generalizations. I see. Like a app or a... Well, no. Like what to do. And so the generalizations that you come to in fitness are like, generally speaking, we want you to get your range of motion and injury prevention dialed in, your durability. Then we'll start to work on 
you know, strengthening the core, and then we'll work on some of the fancier movements. You're not going to move straight to muscle ups, right? So those, that's like generalized path. So we can follow a generalized path for training the mind as well. So the question then is, okay, that sounds great. What's the first step? Yeah, I, I'm sure everybody wants to know yeah. what that is. And you know what it is. Because what's the first thing I teach? Box breathing. Right. And why? Do you know why? Because it controls the autonomic nervous system. Right. It turns that, it gives you control so over So you mean that I was switch. a good student? <laughs> you were a good student. Yeah, give me a fist bump. You're there a you go. There's a few things that happen with controlled nostril breathing. And there's tons of people now teaching this. It's not new. It's thousands of years old, but it's, it's not taught very effectively because there's multiple things happening, right? Box breathing is a physiological practice, it's a psychological practice, and it's a spiritual practice. But if you start as a spiritual practice, then you're going to jump over the physio physiological and the, and the psychological refinement that needs to happen. And we call that a bypass, right? right? Like a spiritual bypass happening all the time. People going from, from A to Z and missing that's probably B to why Y, you know what I mean? Which they are don't get better. important, right? And they don't get better. It and slows them down. Yeah. It's like Gary, one of my yoga teachers said that if, if you're an asshole and you meditate for 20 years, you're just going <laughs> to be a more, calmer asshole. more focused or a more calm asshole. <laughs> you're, you're, yeah, yeah, you're exactly. a calm asshole. So uh -huh. box breathing does a few things. One, it gets you control over that switch we talked about. And so then when you combine box breathing with the second most important aspect of training, which we call fe feeding the courage wolf, that's basically taking that switch and turning it to positive constantly, constantly through watching and, and through attention and just, you know, making sure that you're not just refining the quality of your thought or the quantity, but the quality of your thoughts as well. This is still not deciding what to think because these thoughts are now occurring. You, f you have the sense that they're occurring to you, whereas more advanced you get in your training, then it's just like a blank slate and then you decide what to put on the track. So the idea that you will always have negative thoughts is not necessarily it's true. Not true, no. Because that's kind of what you they can teach. Tra you train that out. You train that out. Right. You can train that out. It takes great attention. So there's a lot of false teachings, and that's one of them, right? And one of the f false teachings is that you can never clear your mind. That's not true. You can clear your mind. Right. Um, so let me back I've up. Been, I've been I've been falsely taught. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. Box breathing is our practice of controlled breathing, and it's super simple and it's safe. There's literally thousands of different patterns that will change your, create a different effect in your uh, psycho and uh, physiology and whatnot. But box breathing, when you when you breathe with it, we have the same duration of inhale, hold, exhale, and hold, and we recommend three to five, depending upon you know if you're a beginner or depending upon your respiratory capacity. It's not Navy SEAL breath hold training. You're not trying to become pass a world out. record or pass out. You're just literally trying to control your breathing, breathe through your nostrils, use your whole lungs, activate your diaphragm, massage the vagus nerve, trigger the parasympathetic nervous system. All of that's happening, right? But also you're collapsing your attention to just this, this happening in your mind, right? And so what we're doing is we're combining arousal and attention control into one training practice. So what's happening is you're, you're de-stressing your body and we have a lifetime of build-up stress. So over time, your body just gets calmer and calmer, which means it gives you, you physically and physiologically more capacity to sit and meditate without the agitation, both mental and physical agitation. Most people really struggle because they sit down and their mind's going all over the place. So they, they just sit for 20 minutes thinking, and they don't get any benefit besides some a little bit of health benefits for not just running around all the time. And they say, I feel better. Great but they were thinking the whole time. Right, and that's the goal, is right. not to. It's, the goal is to begin to, to control think. your thinking. And so what we do is we add a concentration tool to that, right? Now some people like Tangent Meditation, if you get trained by them, they will say um, using their mantra is not a concentration. And I would say that's a little bit false because you're using, you're concentrating on the mantra until you don't need it anymore. So yes. it's like, it's like you're catching a ride on the train of the mantra until you jump off in, in, you know, calmer seas or calmer ground, right? So, but we can train our minds to do that, to both become more concentrated, de-stressed or less aroused, and positive. That's, that's very powerful. It's extremely powerful, right there. And it takes time. Like, that's not a, 
let's do it for three weeks and I'm done. Six months, maybe. Six months, you'll have incredible <laughs> progress. Every day. It's a daily practice. How many 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the evening, ideally. We call it the morning ritual and the evening ritual. And you can layer on, you know, your gratitude and you can layer on visualization, which is not a meditation practice, by the way. Most people mistake visualization for meditation. That's manifestation or creation or healing, right? Because visualization, we're working on our conscious mind in a future or past capacity. Whereas meditation, we're trying to move away from our conscious mind. And, and, and to get control, first get to get control of the conscious mind and then to move away from it to touch into your spiritual center, right? So that's what meditation is. Very different. As many of you know, a part of my concierge medical practice is dedicated to special operations, which include Navy SEALs like Mark Devine. It is incredibly important, whether you are a Navy SEAL, a special operator, or a human who really just wants to be fit, healthy, have good a good quality of life and longevity, you must check out insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lyon. You get it inside, like inside your body, insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lyon. For my listeners, you'll get 20% off the entire Inside Tracker store. Just go check them out. You will not be disappointed. This is a direct-to-consumer blood lab. You'll be able to Look at what is actually happening under the hood. It doesn't necessarily matter how you feel. It matters how you are. The best way to determine how you're going to feel is to actually look. Check out your blood work. You can even do DNA testing. They've got fitness tracking data. Go to insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lyon. My listeners get 20% off. This is a great service if you you do not have a provider that will order the blood work that you want. This is a great way to augment it. Highly recommend. No and don't guess. Now, visualization and imagery can be used to complement. I think it's beyond the scope of what we're talking about here. Do you think that that's the only way to do it for the box breathing and probably not the concentration I, well, it's just found that it's extremely because I, I wouldn't know of any it's other extremely important tools. for most people to have that practice which calms them down and clears their mind of all the excess chatter and and also over time leads them toward a positive state of being and also it sounds like a positive outcome in positive, general uh, an extreme within benefits their life. right here just this within their all life. you do this for the rest yeah. of your life would be extraordinarily beneficial but there is a fourth phase so i've talked about three things arousal control which is de-stressing attention control which is gaining control of your mind and learning where to place it so you control you decide where to put your mind so your mind actually in those spaces of in between that's actually controlled for yeah i get to decide you get to decide right and then the third part is to override the default mode network so you then are choosing daily and down to the minute and down to the moment what you know the positive railroad track is you know is the track to take because you're constantly getting bombarded with negative stuff right and if you don't turn that on and click it on and train it to be on the positive track versus the negative default mode then you're constantly getting pulled back into that and that drains your energy as you know from work in somatics and you know dr david hawkins work like yeah, negative course, energy d will weaken your body positive thought patterns lead to a str more strengthening of the body which leads to a strengthening of the mind and you have this reinforcement right of a positive uh, spiral until that becomes your new default mode so those are the first three w things that are trained with this practice and box breathing is more of a continuum it's not like one you do one thing all the time you, you literally start with the arousal control and then you add the concentration training, and then you add the positive mantra, and then and then we can take this as a tool and we can use it in a day-to-day -day, um, setting to uh, maintain great awareness and maintain a positive mindset. And that, that's more of a, a, a sniper application of it during the day versus the morning, evening ritual application of it, which is changing you over time, right? Then we can move into, once we get control of the body, mind, and we're, we're de-stressed and we're, <laughs> you know, relaxed, we're positive zen, and relaxed and we've zen. got this ability. So what happens with that process is because you're starting to watch 
you're, 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 you're creating this space between your thoughts and what becomes the watcher or the observer or the witness, right? And so that naturally happens, right? It can't, you can't like just say someone, okay, go train your witness. Because it's like, huh? You have to work, you have to train your mind to where suddenly that my metacognitive capacity opens up for you. Because it's quite natural, actually. And so now, and so first the metacognitive happens from the level of mind, and then it happens from the level of awareness. But that's, a, again, that's another discussion that we can get into later. And so when you develop that metacognitive split. And, and metacognitive for the listener thinking about your thinking. thinking about your thinking. Right. So most people are merged with their thoughts, and they mistake themselves for the thoughts. And then as you do these practices, suddenly you create the separation. And the more you practice, the more separate. It's like I said, I can feel like I'm at the center of the ocean and what's happening is over there and it's not going to disturb me but in the beginning I might just be a couple feet under the surface right right, right. I can still feel the waves and it's like whoa it's getting pretty saucy up there you yeah know what I mean? so the more you practice the more s uh, separation you have and then then you can effectively do mindfulness mm -hmm. and so this is why mindfulness is not effective for most people they haven't developed the metacognitive capacity I think that's really important yeah. because there's a lot of push for mindfulness, and people probably feel like failures. They're not ready for it. Because they feel as if they're practicing a mindfulness technique and not <laughs> becoming more mindful. That's right. But it's really because their foundation They're, they're is not becoming built. more full of mind instead of <laughs> mindful. Yikes. Right, and also the problem when you, when you sit and think about some things that are negative that, or that you don't want, it's like, it's like being obsessive talk therapy about things that aren't working in your life and, and, and recognizing, not recognizing that those things are never improving. It's because every time you think and you talk about them, they get worse because you're reinforcing them. You're adding energy to them. Now, it's okay, like with cognitive behavioral therapy, to identify what's not working. Right. And then you immediately identify habitual patterns of thought and action that are the, the opposite or, or that are going to cancel that out. Right. And so then you work on those. It's kind of like, you know, you want to switch off and go in that right railroad track of the positive. You can do it with thinking patterns, but also behavioral patterns and merging the two is best. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So. Mindfulness, when you sit, if you if you just download a mindfulness app and you just sit and try to meditate, but you haven't developed metacognition and you're merged with your thoughts, then you're generally and those thoughts are default mode negative, right. you can actually make your life worse. Gosh, everyone is listening and <laughs> they're thinking, oh my God, what am I gonna do? Yeah, why am I, why does this stuff keep showing up? It's because yeah. you keep obsessing about it or keep, mm. keep your mind on it. And what's, what's, you know, your mind is basically just projecting out in reality and whatever you're, what's in, whatever's in your mind all the time is gonna eventually show up in the mm. world. You know, I um, am curious, and maybe the listener is too, how do you navigate disappointment? Do you have a process in place? If something, inevitably something will trigger you at some point. Sure. Do you have a systems or process? Well, at, at the, yes. And the tools are, they come directly from what we're talking about and the outcomes of that, right? So first off, I have a process that I teach that is an active, interdictive process to take control over your mind when something bad happens or negative happens right and so it's not and it's not just putting a happy glad wrapper on it and, and it's not a, being in denial it's a very deliberate attempt to say this happened so i witness it and this can only happen because i've created that metacognitive split because i can i can see something that happens that could be called disappointing or could or or didn't align with align with my original expectations but i've learned over time not to be attached to the outcomes that I'm hoping for, or that I desire, or that I, you know, when I do my goal planning, I recognize that it's just, it's just a design, right? Like an architectural design. But I might go to the city, and the city could say, no, change this, change that, change this, change. And if I was really attached to that design, I'd be really disappointed because it wasn't reality, according to all the other things that had to happen. So, all of our plans or goals are like that. Right. The universe gets a say. And that so knowing universe, yeah, no, just that annoying universe. Yeah, yeah. And so when something disappointing happens or what, be, what would be devastating to another individual, I look at that and say, oh, look at that. It's interesting. That just happened. It didn't meet my expectations and certainly not where I thought I was going, but it doesn't define who I am. And so I witness that. And then because of the, the negative feed that's going to immediately start to come in and try to attack my being, 
ness. I can which say, is predictable. Which is predictable. Right? And it's right? going to happen. I can look at that and say, okay, that's going to trigger me. And so now I'm going to interdict that because I don't want that trigger to disrupt my life right now because I've got plans. Now, if it's so big that I've got to deal with it and I know that it needs to change my plans, you know, let's say a major lawsuit, like this happened with Seal Fit when someone passed away at one of our events. Like that was a different, that was disappointing. I mentally processed that. You know, it, it really hit me hard. Yeah. I did this practice. It took me, you know, maybe weeks instead of days or moments. This happened in 2016, but it was because it was a big freaking deal. Yeah, it was. Right? Yes. And in, I knew it was going to change the business. So I had to, like, step back and recognize this happened. It wasn't my fault. It wasn't me. It wasn't my business's fault. Right. So I witnessed it. Now, I interdicted all of the negativity and said, I'm not going to let this affect me. Right? I'm going to put my little mental barrier up. Now, I'm not in denial. I recognize there are certain things that will happen, but I'm not going to let it consume me. And then I'm going to redirect my mind to the A, a positive territory, and B, like, you know, let's get, let's get busy and figure this out. Like the same thing happened with the COVID. Like, let's get busy and figure this out, and let's be responsive instead of reactive. And then the fourth step is I'm going to maintain my distance from this and maintain my positive attitude by continuing my practice and by having a mantra around it, right? And a mantra is simply I've got an internal dialogue that is, sets, my, sets me up in an appropriate relationship with either an individual or a situation that's happening. This is like another reason the SEALs are so darn powerful is they've got these incredible inner dialogues around their power yeah, and, and what they're capable of. Yeah. So that's a mantra. I call that process the worm process just because that's <laughs> the, you know, if you don't do it, it'll worm inside your head. Yeah. But also it's just the acronym. WIS, interdict, redirect, yeah. and maintain. This is an active process. Yeah. But, but it's built upon, it's built upon the arousal control because when I do this process, I'm also box breathing, right? It's very and intentional. It's intentional, right? There's, there's a practice that happens in real time. So it's built upon the arousal control, the box breathing. It's built upon the attention control of knowing how and where to put my attention, which allows me to interdict and see. And the metacognition that allows me to not identify with that disappointment, but to recognize it's just something that happened. Like we said earlier, challenges happen. This is a doozy. It's going to be a great lesson. So embrace the suck of it and let's go, right? And then yeah. the power, concentration power of my mind to be able to redirect to something else and the capacity because I recognize my mind as a tabula rasa where I can just, or, you know, one of those etch-a-sketches, yeah. right? I can etch-a-sketch everything off it, and I can insert a new picture, and I can point my mind toward that picture. So I can redirect my mind stream. Imagine your mind is like a stream. I can literally move the banks of, of this me mental stream and have it flow in a different direction. It's and, like weaponizing the human, weaponizing well, the human the mind. The mind is extraordinarily yeah. powerful. It has unlimited potential. Practically anything that you want to create, you can create. We don't even know. We're just we're just dipping, you know, dipping our toe in the water. You know, it seems like right now we're so divided, just in society. And I think that, you know, what can people do as their own leader? Yeah. Do you do you think oh, that there's 100%. something? In fact, what I will say to this is the only thing people can really do is be their own leader and a lot of people are spending a lot of their time trying to change other world and change the world or change other people and they haven't changed themselves and actually you can do more damage like if you're not peaceful inside and you try to change the world then you're gonna f you're gonna end up bringing more violence in the world so like all the justice warriors out there who are listening it's great good job but but be a justice warrior on yourself be first peaceful. Right, because throwing Molotov cocktails because you don't agree with the other political side, that's just fomenting more violence. It's making things worse. Yeah, and it can be in health and wellness. It, it can everything. seem so like everything. Yeah, so, anything. So get your body under control. So get your body healthy. Yep. Sleep well, eat well, and exercise. If you do those two, three things, guess what? Your brain is going to get healthier. Start box breathing to, to de-arouse and begin to box breathe where you concentrate on that pattern so that you can train your mind to be more concentrated and to have the attention control. Great. Now we can get into the metacognition. The metacognition mm. will slowly open. Now we can turn our awareness and say, okay, how am I doing as a human? Who am I? Why am I on this planet? 
This is the three P's that we teach. What's my purpose? What are my principles? What am I passionate about? Mm -hmm. And how can I serve this world from a place of alignment with that, with my archetypal energy, and with this from the center? And when you, and when you serve and lead from the center, you always lead with nonviolence. You always lead with compassion. Can you imagine that? Like if yeah, we taught I leaders to lead from the center and to lead with nonviolence and compassion, the world would be a very different place. So you have to, Gandhi nailed it, right? You have to be the change you want to see in the world first mm -hmm. as, a, as an individual and as a leader, and every individual is a leader of something yeah. first themselves. So you've got to work on yourself. This is why when I teach, whether it's Navy SEALs or corporate CEOs, self-mastery precedes service because you've got to be able to serve from the center. Mm -hmm. You've got to be able to serve as a healthy human being. You've got to be able to serve as a courageous human being who's willing to do the right thing even when no one's looking. You've got to be able to especially serve. Especially when no yeah, one's especially looking. When, and you've got, you got to be able to serve with authentic humility, not projecting your bullshit and the others, not projecting perf perfectionism and righteousness and, or thinking you've got all the answers. Teams know that you don't have all the answers, right? The, the, t the answer lies somewhere in the team, not in you. Right. So you lead from the center. That takes great discipline, self-awareness. It's daily practice of self-mastery. There's no there there. Now, we work on that and we get more clear and then we can serve from there. We're more grounded, we're, more, we're stronger, we're more clear, we're more aligned. Ultimately, self-mastery and service come together into one moment, into one thing, right? And so this is where karma and dharma meet. Because self-mastery is about refining your karma and understanding your dharma. Service is about fulfilling it and not accruing any more negative karma. As you deliver goodness in the world, you actually burn it off and then, and then you accrue positive karma. Wow, that's probably the shortest class in leadership I've ever <laughs> given. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, I think it's really meaningful for people because... There's a lot of external pressures, and it takes people away from arguably being their best self. And True. And well, I think people succumb to or become attached to other people's expectations, and that's magnified, like you said, through social media and yeah. through, you know, maybe it's just also just access to the information so we see other people being successful and, or the level of success, and we're just like, oh, I'm supposed to be there. And so we get, we get this, you know, because we live in duality, we set up this comparison machine. We're always comparing ourselves against other people. And the problem with comparison is that no two people are alike, and you could be comparing yourself against the wrong set of standards. And probably are. And you probably are. So what is important, most important is for you to determine your own set of standards and not to think that you have to live to someone else's standards. Now, they should be extremely high standards, but they should be right for you. Right, And so yeah. let's take wealth and abundance, for example. You might say, well, my standard is to have absolute abundance and freedom from need and want in the world. Great. That might end up being a million bucks or a half a million bucks or living in Ecuador on $1,200 a month. Right. right. It might be it. Right. For someone else, it might be $100 million. Right. But that's right for them and the other is right for you. Right. And so that's why when I say when we do goal setting, I like to look at goals as targets. First of all, there's no there there. You're never going to actually hit it and it's going to look like what you think. And secondarily, make sure that you're tending to the being before the doing. Make sure you are tending to the being. Yeah. And so there are the being doing. goals. The being goals are yeah. who do I want to be? W which is tied to your why. You should first answer the question of why am I here? But you usually don't ask, why do I want to be? You say, why am I here? Oh, well, that's my archetype. I'm a warrior. Oh, that makes sense. My why is to be a warrior. And in this stage, to be a warrior, teacher, sage, poet, whatever. Poet would be kind of cool. Author. Yeah. You're kind of that, um, too. Yeah. And then the, the, that's the being. In the, and so that's the why. And then the doing is, okay, so how am I going to do that? How am I going to bring that into the world? And that seems to unfold. It does. It can unfold. Initially, you have to set to some, some, you know, some actually tactical goals that yeah. have objective outcomes. But I think that there's certain areas of your life that other people like 
say, you know, put a target like a number down for your wealth. And I say, well, the problem with that is you could then uh, um, consume enormous amount of energy going after a target that isn't really right for you. And then that, that could be a real problem. You could uh, you have a little bit of an expectation hangover with that one, you know. So when it comes to that, you could say, well, my being goal is abundance. And my target is to have enough money coming in that I don't have to, and no debt, right? And so I can, I can then identify some micro targets that maybe are doing targets, you know, around like a certain number of clientele, certain revenue generation, certain amount of the money in the bank, but, but then don't be attached to those outcomes, right? Because they're never going to be exactly the way you think they are. They might be may far exceed it, right? So if you take care of the being, then the doing generally will follow. And as you get more and more refined in your practice and living from the center, then the doing becomes more and more spontaneous. And it just flows. That is amazing. I think everybody strives for that. Yeah. Where it's not the push, it's the flow. The Japanese have a term that they use in the context of mastery and it's shibumi it means shibumi. effortless perfection now we think of flow as something that happens physiologically and you know and you can kind of like optimize for flow <laughs> yeah i love this this more spiritual concept of flow life flow happens when you're aligned with your dharma you're not creating any negative karma because you've trained yourself to be positive and in service and and you're not attached to the outcomes in life and you Train yourself so that you're so present and your mind is so powerful that things happen spontaneously and they're the right thing. That's incredible. And that's flow. That's, that's life flow. That is incredible. And that is a beautiful place to end. Ooh, yeah. Mark, thank you. thank you so much for sitting down with me. I always learn something. And I know that the listener will, will link where they can find you. Um, and I've read all your books, actually. Thanks. And I don't even know which is my favorite. You don't have to have mm, a favorite. That's no. like ranking them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, I'll put all those you, You'll there. like my new one. You, it's been five years in the coming, and I finally, this book, Uncommon, which I really, you know, struggle with because I wanted it to be something that could be very useful for um, and practical, but at the same time, an evolution of what I wrote in Unveiled Mind. So it's like a sequel to it. I call it uncommon. And I finally, and also because I was self-publishing it, you know, horrible about setting my own deadlines. And so I was kept revi <laughs> revised it like five times. Can't do that. And yeah. so finally I sent it to my publisher. I said, screw it. I'm, I'm done mucking around with this and I'll never self-publish it, apparently. And I sent it to him last week and he just sent me a note this morning because I love it. Wow, amazing. Yeah. yeah, so I guess we'll get that out probably next year, early exciting. next year. Exciting, very exciting. So maybe that'll become your favorite book. Um, it's possible. What are you reading these days? Oh, man. I read a book a week. So I'm reading a lot of different things. A lot of stuff I read similar to you around kind of like what I'm thinking about and podcasting about. And this might surprise people, but I also always, I love audiobooks for sci-fi. So I just absolutely have Oh, a, okay. I'm going to tell something. I have something. a few sci-fi series that I absolutely just jones on. Okay, so and I, I was my favorite <laughs> audio tell me sci-fi uh, author or or reader or artist, I guess. Okay, R.C. Bray, just mind blowing. I'd love to get you on my podcast. <laughs> so I'm always listening to Expedition Force or Wayward Galaxy or one of these crazily cool, you know, sci-fi series on audiobooks, which brings my mind alive. It's like watching a great movie. So you know, Shane loves sci-fi. Does he? Oh, good for him. I, I think a lot of seals do. I, I mean, I, I don't know, we, but you know, he, I, I I had the domain space seals, <laughs> you know, registered a long time. Still that would it. be that would be very unique. Yeah. And he's selling it now. We can <laughs> that's right. You want, we can you auction want the it off. Space seals, you can have it. <laughs> um, hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, hundred and fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> Contact me. Contact me. Um, you get a commission. Yes. Yes. You are one of the most well thought out humans I have ever met. Now we just got to make me one of the more sought out humans. <laughs> I have no doubt that that is uh, That's actually be careful there. What you ask for yeah, <laughs> yeah. Be careful. I, Sandy's going to be mad at me because <laughs> it's going to be back to your back traveling like a banshee. But um, 
Thank you so much You're for spending welcome, time Georgia. with me. Thank you. You're a great interviewer. It was a lot of fun.